So the Ottomans had lost World War I and the three Pashas who led the CUP government, Jamal Pasha, Enver Pasha and Talat Pasha had fled. The constitutional ceremonial caliph Mehmet V was hauled out of his palace to conduct the armistice to end the, to end the war. And there was a lot of fear in Ottoman society as to what the treaty that the Ottomans would have to sign with the Allies would entail for their lands. They thought that they were going to carve up the lands of Anatolia amongst the Allies. At the same time that all this was happening, the public were gathering around a figure who was a war hero from World War I, um, who fought the British at Gallipoli and the Russians in the Caucasus. This man was determined to reverse any embarrassing treaty and rid the Anatolian heartland of any colonial influences. He was called Mustafa Kemal. It looked like the Ottomans had yet another hero. Or not, as the case may be. In the year 1919, the Caliph Mehmet VI sent Mustafa Kemal east to the Caucasus area to demilitarize according to the terms of the armistice that he had signed with the Allies. While he was there, the Greeks landed in Western Anatolia in Izmir and started taking land. There was a feeling amongst the Turks in Anatolia that losing out to empires like the British and the French was, was acceptable because they were world empires. But losing to the Greeks, who were not an empire, who they had ruled for the last 500 years, that was unacceptable and totally embarrassing. This is when Mustafa Kemal contacted his all military friends from World War I and they met to agree a pact in which they agreed that the integrity of the land of Anatolia should not be compromised and there should be no deals done with Greeks or Armenians. The Caliph Mehmet VI was now in a tricky situation because if he moved with the military officers he would then invoke the wrath of the Allies. If he did not move with the officers he would then invoke the wrath of his people who hated the fact that Greeks had landed and were taking their land. In early 1920 Mustafa Kemal moved his National Assembly to Ankara to start mobilizing popular resistance just in case he was needed. Most of the people who came rallying to his call were soldiers who fought the Ottomans in World War I. While that was happening, there was disagreements between the Ottoman government based in Constantinople and the Allies over the impending treaty. So the Allies dissolved the Ottoman parliament. Having heard this, Mustafa Kemal called, called for fresh elections back in Ankara. Uh, for a new Grand National Assembly of which he was elected the leader. Now there were two seats of power, one in Constantinople, the Ottoman seat, and the second in Anatolia, in Ankara, led by Mustafa Kemal. At this point, very interestingly, Mustafa Kemal still professed loyalty to the Caliph. Then Mehmed VI signed what's known as the Treaty of Sevres, which confirmed the carve-up of Anatolia amongst these five different ethnic groups Britain, France, Italy, the Greeks and Armenia. But Mustafa Kemal was poised and ready with his army to push back against any troops who might land on Anatolian soil. All he needed now was a bit of good diplomacy here and there and the treaty would very likely be reversed. The Russian Empire had always been the traditional foe of the Ottoman Empire for the last 150 years. And in 1917, during World War I, they underwent a communist revolution, which meant that they were no longer upon a Christian Orthodox ideology and not interested in taking Constantinople, the second Rome. They were more interested in internal stability in the wake of their revolution. So Mustafa Kemal signed a treaty with them, the Treaty of Moscow in 1921, which concluded the borders with them on the Eastern Front in the Caucasus. And it also prevented an Armenian state from coming into existence. So that was the first good act of diplomacy. Secondly, the French had signed the Sykes-Picot Agreement with the British during World War I and had got what they wanted, which was Syria and what was going to go on to become Lebanon. They weren't interested in fighting another war uh, so soon after World War I. 
and so they decided to sign a treaty with Mustafa Kemal as well, which concluded the borders between Anatolia and Syria. Notice how the foreign empires are dealing with Mustafa Kemal and his government, the National Assembly, based in Ankara, and not with the Ottoman government based in Constantinople. Next with the Italians, they could see that there was no longer going to be a, a huge coalition of countries who were all going to act together, so they decided to drop out. And they also weren't happy because the Greeks had jumped the gun and had already started taking land in Anatolia. The only two countries left were the British and the Greeks. And uh, the Greeks were encouraged by the, by the British to take as much land as they could and had already entered and were making their way through the country. What was not clear was how much the British were actually going to help the Greeks. deep into Anatolia even reaching Sorut Ertugul Razi's hometown and from the gunfire you can actually see some holes in the walls of his mausoleum. The problem uh, that this gave the Greeks was that they had left them they spread themselves too thin and the British Empire decided they weren't going to send any troops so the Greeks were all by themselves and this meant it was even easier for Mustafa Kemal and his troops to push them back all the way to the western border uh, to a city called Izmir. The fighting was intense. Some pe uh, many Greeks died in the fighting. Uh, some Greeks fled on ships, but many drowned in the sea. Having gotten rid of the Greeks, the time had now come to take the capital. Mustafa Kemal and his troops marched on Constantinople, which had been declared an international zone by the Allies, and he managed to take it very easily. Now, the Treaty of Sevres had been completely overturned, and the only choice which the Allies had was to negotiate a new treaty with Mustafa Kemal himself. In 1923, the Grand National Assembly, led by Mustafa Kemal, signed the Treaty of Lausanne, which superseded the Treaty of Sevres and brought the, uh, the modern uh, borders of Turkey into existence. What's interesting is that this monument, the Treaty of Lausanne monument, is, is not in Ankara, the capital. It's not in Istanbul, the biggest city in the country. It's actually on the outskirts of Edirne, the, the northernmost town in Turkey in Europe today, on the European side. And the question is, why is that? You'd expect it to be in the capital or the biggest city. And the answer is simple. 500 meters that way is the Greek border. And it's a very, very tall structure. So the Greeks would be able to see this every single day and be reminded of it. It's as if they want to say to the Greeks, you fought us, you invaded us, you tried to take our land, but we, f we fought you back, we repelled you, and we are still here. The only question is now, who are, are we? What is the identity of, of we? Because now, at this point, a time when uh, this treaty was signed, there was actually two rival governments in the country. The first was the Ottoman government in Constantinople. The second one was Mustafa Kemal's Grand National Assembly in Ankara. However, 
the caliph in Constantinople was not uh, in a good situation because he signed the Treaty of Sevres. He lost lots of public opinion because of that. He did not get involved in the Greek war. Assalamu alaikum. So um, he didn't um, he didn't get involved in the Greek War of Independence, and he wasn't involved in the um, the signing of the treaties with Russia or France to conclude the borders of his own land in the east and in the south. At the same time, Mustafa Kemal had just won some elections. He used all these factors to say that the Constantinople-based government is no longer the legitimate representative of the people of this landmass. And with that, he decided to abolish the Sultanate. And Mehmed VI went into exile and a republic was proclaimed. But as we have seen many, many times before, this sick man kept coming back from the dead. He still had one more trick up his sleeve. The only question is, would it fool people or would he finally be confirmed dead? Thank you.